We're going to just uh, give this a couple of minutes for everyone to join us. Um, we have some folks um, joining from different time zones. Um, so we're just going to hang out for about a minute while folks enter into the room. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, ask that we're going to go ahead and make all of you panelists. Um, so I believe what if you guys um, actually uh, give me one sec. <clears throat> so I, uh, Lisa, I can go ahead and do that and, and promote everybody to a panelist just to make it more interactive for the group. Um, and then if you feel comfortable turning on your camera or asking a question, you can feel free to um, put on your camera so we can see your faces um, or also just unmute if you have a question. Thank you so much, Linda. Okay, so I, as Linda is making all of you panelists, we're gonna, uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and so if you have questions, uh, there will certainly be pauses throughout. And this is a really informal presentation. We actually really want this to be more of a discussion. It's a sensitive topic, uh, but really, you know, if you, if you have a question, another parent will likely have the same question. Um, so please unmute or if you raise your hand, I'll be monitoring that or um, be monitoring the chat as well. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started and introduce myself and also our very special guest tonight, Dr. Paula Quattrimoni. Um, I'm Lisa Rothling. I'm the Director of Counseling here at the Hill School. Uh, here at our counseling clinic, we have five licensed clinicians, and so we deal with a, a wide variety of mental health concerns, and some of those concerns do involve uh, disordered eating behaviors. And so uh, part of my mission this year is just doing as much education as I can around disordered eating, um, I've only been here at the Hill School in a clinical role since 2019, and what I noticed is we uh, created the Counseling Center and really started doing more evaluation uh, with at least students coming through the Counseling Center is that there was a large number of students that were struggling with disordered eating or even eating disorders. And so I've really been trying to educate students and parents and coaches, and uh, we're going to be ramping these efforts up in the next uh, years as well. Uh, I've been lucky enough to meet Dr. Quattrimoni as she did some work with our girls hockey team. And since then, she has done presentations with our third, fourth, and fifth form students. And we're trying to get the sixth form scheduled. Uh, and also has done training with our wellness team, our coaches, and now tonight with our parents. Um, so I just wanted to read a little bit about uh, Dr. Quattrimoni. Um, uh, she's a senior consultant for Walden Behavioral Care, and she's one of the nation's top minds. Uh, intersecting sports nutrition and eating disorders. I think also what's really important to know is that Dr. Quattrimoni is a mom and she's also a mom of athletes and she's gonna be really talking, I think to us tonight from her expert lens and also from her parent tab, which is um, incredibly special. Um, she's a registered dietitian and she has more than a decade of experience working with athletes with disordered eating and has published several, several papers on both clinical experiences and qualitative research on recovery experiences of athletes. Um, she's currently at uh, Boston University and she has been kind enough to kind of help walk Hill School through some policy and some uh, conversation around um, what disordered eating looks like and how to have that conversation uh, with your team. So I'm going to pause and um, I'm gonna be around and I'm gonna be here uh, monitoring the chat, but please, this is a great time to ask anybody if they have questions. Um, we'll be here to answer all of those. So I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, Paula, and we'll get started. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you all for, for turning up to join us um, tonight. I'm really happy to be here. Um, again, really speaking as a parent, um, raising you know, student athletes and helping them to be successful. Um, and as Lisa just described, this is my background. This is me before my COVID hair got really, really long. 
Um, and, um, you know, this is just a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. So happy to have this conversation with you all tonight. So in the sessions that I did with your students, I gave them uh, four takeaway messages. I always like to start with my, my sort of punchline. And so I wanted to review with you a little bit about the information I shared with them about, you know, taking responsibility for their own nutrition, but also really want to turn this into a conversation for you all as parents and the important role that you play. So my four take home messages for the students were first and foremost about showing up for nutrition and putting it on their radar screen as something that I want them to care about. And the first is to understand that food is fuel for their body and how important that is to give them the energy to do whatever it is, to do their academics and have really great functional brain power or to play sports or to be a performer, a dancer, a musician, whatever it is, um, jobs, internships, whatever the students are doing. To eat well, to feel good, like how important it is both physically and physiologically, but also emotionally, the mental health component of good nutrition. Um, to know that you have to have a plan. This is a phrase my dad always used to say to me that a failure to plan is a plan to fail. So again, trying to pass off that responsibility for good nutrition, especially as students are getting, you know, soon to go off to college and have to take more of this into their own hands. And then the last part is about, you know, not sabotaging yourself and setting yourself up for success and not, um, you know, undermining your best efforts. So then I tried to give them tidbits within each of those four categories and just help them understand that, you know, why does your body need fuel? No matter what your goal is, you know, academic, sports, all the different things I just mentioned, that nutrition is an ally. It's a tool in their arsenal or their toolkit. It's going to keep them healthy. It's going to prevent injuries. And if they have an injury, they're going to recover faster. But for the day-to-day -day function and, you know, the physical, fo uh, the mental focus for their academics and the clarity and their stamina to get through their very long days, nutrition is an ally. And so I talked with them about, you know, what should a performance plate look like and what are the key components? I'm going to talk on the next slide about being a competent eater, because I think it's um, truly something that we want our children to achieve. But again, having a plan around hydration, around fueling, and around the important use of snacks, you know, we call it in sports nutrition, recovery nutrition, getting nutrition after your workout or after your practice. And knowing that, you know, there are no shortcuts to good nutrition. So taking a multivitamin or a whey protein supplement is not going to make up for a low quality diet. And so we have to take a very much food first approach. So eating competence is a topic I love talking about, including with parents, because it's oftentimes something that gets a really good foundation in the home environment when a child is growing up. It actually comes from the child feeding literature. And it's basically, you know, just like we want our students and our children to be competent in so many areas of their life, right? We want them to be competent students and we want them to be competent drivers when they get their license. And we want them to be competent babysitters when they're taking care of their siblings or other people's children. We want them also to be competent at eating. And so what does that mean? It means that they feel good about fueling their body and putting gas into their gas tank every day, that they you know, derive positive emotions and that they have a positive relationship with that, that they're reliable about feeding themselves and they know when they're gonna get their next meal or where that next meal or snack is gonna work into their day. It also requires you know, this real understanding and a belief that all foods can fit into your eating plan, that there's no off limit foods, you know, again, unless you have a food allergy and something that is dangerous for you to consume because you'll have, you know, an anaphylactic reaction, say to peanuts, as my middle daughter has. But, you know, short of that, you know, all varieties of foods, there's, there's no um, foods that are off limits. And at the same time, there's no magical food or magical supplement that is gonna make up for other areas where your diet's lacking the enjoyment of food and foods that are meaningful to you from your culture, from your childhood, from your palate and things that are, you know, that you really truly enjoy, allowing those into your daily diet and not being rigid with lots of food rules. And the last part about competent eating is tuning in and listening to your body. When your body is hungry and your stomach's growling and your head's a little foggy or you have that headache, it's your body's way of telling you that it's time for more fuel. And at the same time, 
listening to your fullness and your satiety cues as to when you're satisfied and you know it's time to leave the dining hall right or you know hmm, I thought I wanted dessert but I'm really kind of full I'm going to wait and maybe have that couple hours later just listening to what your body's wisdom is telling you so I actually wrote a blog post for this for Walden where I do my consulting work and it's it was really a how-to for parents how to raise competent eaters and as I said shifting some of this responsibility to the students is really appropriate during you know the middle school high school and of course the college years so one of my big goals tonight is to share lots of resources with you um and so I talked with the students about a strategy. How do you, you know, plan for your performance? And I talked about it in three steps, focusing on the three major components of any meal. So your colorful fruits and veggies and fats that are gonna be really important for um, different functions in your body, the importance of carbohydrate, the main fuel source, and the importance of protein, and how each of these serve to protect fuel and build our bodies, especially during adolescence when, you know, they're growing and developing and achieving puberty and all that fun stuff. And then, you know, what are the food choices that could go onto your plate? And I, I tend to talk about these as everyday choices and once in a while choices. Again, no good food, bad food, no red light, yellow light, green light, so to speak, you know, all foods can fit. And it's just a matter of like, you know, what are you choosing when and how often are you eating, um, you know, certain foods in, in your daily diet, and particularly when it comes to athletes and performance, like what's going to digest well before practice, or, you know, what's going to be really convenient that you can get that recovery nutrition after your workout. So trying to give them very tangible tips and some resources, like, you know, a simple one, two, three, how to put your plate together. Um, Linda, did you, I don't know if Linda had a question or if the hand is just raised. Yeah, no, um, we were just testing the hand raising. Sorry. Okay, perfect. <laughs> this is another article that I'll send out. I'm going to send you the entire set of these slides, but also some of the resources. And this is a paper that I published um, about nutrition advice for adolescents with an eye towards athletes. But again, making the point that the foundation of food needs to be in place before we start thinking about anything fancy in sports nutrition or any supplements or protein powders, that it's really the same one, two, three, proteins, carbs, and the colorful fruits and vegetables that offer so much antioxidants and protective nutrition. So I will send this article for you. It's written really for health professionals and for parents. Um, the second message that I went over with the students again is what should your plate look like? And there are many models out there really trying to promote adequacy and representation and inclusion of the variety of different food groups. So this comes from the USDA Choose My Plate. And then in a minute, I'm going to show you a tailored version of this advice called the athlete's plate, but just some, you know, things that they can strive for and the importance of staying in balance, meaning, you know, including all the food groups, try not to exclude anything or really, you know, remove it from your diet, be physically active and strive for, you know, whole fresh foods and fewer processed foods. Again, sometimes that's not always possible, depending on the environment we're in or if we're traveling or whatnot. And to understand how important variety is because of all the different nutrients, that they would get from the different food groups and even from different colored foods within um, you know, the rainbow of choices. So this is the athlete's plate. And again, I've given you lots of links for where you can find these resources online, just visually representing like the proportionality on a plate, how all the food groups should be there and you know, about half the plate being your fruits and vegetables and then the importance of the, the, the grains and the proteins. Um, talking a lot with the students about planning because good nutrition doesn't just happen. It's something you have to work at. So, you know, there's not any secrets or, you know, you know, tricks of the trade, so to speak. It's really about common sense. It's about listening to your body. And it's about having a plan and knowing your schedule so that you have food available either for that long bus ride after that game, that away game, or, you know, in your gym bag, you know, as you're leaving the locker room after a strength and conditioning workout, like how are you going to get some nutrition to refuel your muscles? The other big part of this is the information that's out there that's bombarding our students, whether it's on social media, things they hear at the gym, things that are advertised on the radio, 
there's so much information coming their way and it's not always credible or reliable or accurate. And also it might not be appropriate for them as adolescents. Like this is one of the questions I always like to ask, like where do you think your students are getting their nutrition advice? I mean, Tom Brady's method, you know, TB12 might be really successful for him, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna meet the nutritional needs of a 16 year old college football player or a high school football player. And so, you know, the concept of what is out there in the media or what's perpetuated by people who really don't have the training in the education to give proper nutrition advice, but we know it's all, it happens all the time because everybody eats it's easy for everybody to be an expert on nutrition, or at least to say, well, this works for me, you should try that. But that doesn't mean it's appropriate for our teenagers. And again, what's out there on social media is a whole mixed bag of things. And this has really gotten to a very escalated place through the COVID pandemic when kids have been more isolated and more online. And there's been more, you know, fitspiration and diet culture or pushing of supplements or all kinds of crazy, you know, keto diets and cleanses and things. And we have to, you know, have conversations with our students so that they can really understand and process all this information. So I like to say, you know, cleanse your social media, pay attention to who you're following. And here are some great sports dietitians, for example, at universities with sports nutrition programs where you can follow along what they're recommending for their athletes and see how food focused it is and see how it can relate to your life. So again, trying to put resources into their hands. And so the last part that I want to really dive into is about avoiding the self-sabotage. And this really requires that our students know what their nutritional needs are, and most do not. And so again, where are they getting that advice? Um, relying on becoming a competent eater, because that is one of the best protections. Um, in our research, we see that people who score high on eating competence have lower risk factors for things like disordered eating or body image dissatisfaction. And then on the flip side, people who tend to come into treatment for an eating disorder score very, very low on eating competence. So I know from clinical practice in my research that this is really a protective strategy. So it's something that we really want to help our students build up. Listening to your body and its wisdom, like I talked about, taking days off from you know, the exercise and the sport, especially if the athlete is, you know, fatigued or injured or, you know, just, you know, burning the candle at both ends. It's, again, your body's telling you, you need a rest. It's super important. And so trying to help them understand those messages and avoiding some of the common pitfalls that can really derail your best efforts at, at nutrition. So what I want to spend most of the rest of this time is talking about like, what are some of the red flags, the concerns you might notice, the changes in behavior um, or changes in their thinking and their, their cognitions and their thoughts about nutrition or about their bodies and helping us recognize you know, when we need to intervene and where to get help to connect to resources. And so, you know, especially when it comes to athletes, especially with things like, um, you know, messages out there, you know, oh, you might, you'd run faster if you dropped five or 10 pounds, or, um, you know, it's particularly risky in sports, for example, where there's an aesthetic, like a judging component. My middle daughter is a competitive figure skater. So for example, in the figure skating sport or in gymnastics um, or in certain, you know, areas of dance or even weight-based sports like crew or wrestling, for example, um, you know, there's a lot of, diet talk and messages sometimes from coaches sometimes from teammates sometimes from social media or professional athletes that drive our kids to be under fueled where they're skipping meals they're you know taking food groups out of their diet they're becoming vegetarian or vegan and they're really restricting whether it's intentional or unintentional because they're trying to be better at their sport um and coupled with that, they're oftentimes overtraining and not taking rest days or not taking that advice to fully heal that injury before they get back to their sport. And because there's so much fear that if I don't do this, that I'm gonna be set back or you know, someone else is gonna take my position in my sport and I'm never gonna you know, fight my way back. But the truth is that time off doesn't make you slower or put you more at risk of those things, but training injured and overtraining and under fueling is what actually sabotages. So helping to understand this balance is really important. 
because there are so many things that get in the way of good nutrition. And some of it is, you know, just not having the awareness and the education to know really how much food and uh, fuel a, an athlete and a growing adolescent athlete needs, missing out on meals, you know, kids who don't want to eat breakfast in the morning or, you know, they skip lunch, um, you know, prioritizing other things. Maybe they're in study hall or going to the library to, you know, crank out on their academics, but how important it is to fuel when you're trying to um, use your brain as hard as you are academically. Um, the clean eating sort of, um, there's, there's been so much attention to clean eating and it's it really can be taken to extremes, again, especially when it's not appropriate advice for an adolescent. And, and, and other, I tend to use the term uninformed vegetarianism, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with vegetarian eating, particularly if it's been a, been a longstanding habit in your family or your cultural or, you know, um, animal rights, you know, environmental reasons. But unfortunately, it's a place where sometimes students are influenced to be, to adopt very restrictive eating patterns and they don't exactly know how to meet their nutritional needs. You know, being vegetarian doesn't just mean eat salad and pizza with, you know, with vegetables instead of pepperoni and meatballs. It means you need to eat beans and tofu and other alternative proteins. And so without getting the education on how to meet your nutritional needs and just going vegetarian or vegan and cutting out those food groups, you're really putting yourself at nutritional risk. So these are places where I think it's great to connect with a dietitian to get very customized advice. Um, because these can become very slippery slopes, just like dieting. Like, you know, some people enter dieting behavior very well intentioned and they have really, you know, appropriate goals, but when it goes to an extreme and it becomes an obsession and a dissatisfaction with the body and a lot of sort of negative self-talk or just, you know, weighing yourself multiple times a day, getting very fixated over the numbers, that's when it starts to go down a slippery slope towards more disordered thoughts and disordered behaviors. Um, and it, you know, basically overall can be characterized as a very unhealthy relationship with food, an unhealthy relationship with exercise, or an unhealthy relationship with your body, and all of those things combined. So I actually did a podcast with one of my colleagues on the hidden truth about clean eating and how this can be a slippery slope to an eating disorder. So um, you can find that online if you're interested in that podcast as well. And I haven't even talked yet about calories, but calories are very, very personal and highly individualized. Um, I, when I talk with students, I show them the slide, I call it the tale of two sisters because these are my two daughters. The competitive figure skater who is probably about maybe five foot three, five foot four, spends as many hours and maybe even more hours than her sister who's almost five foot 10 who's a hockey goalie and you know entirely different hydration needs from the amount of equipment that my goalie is wearing very different you know even though they come from the same parents and have the same genetics they should not be eating the same food necessarily at least in quantities at my dinner table because their needs are so personal and individualized and so the problem here is that there's a huge tendency to compare right we compare with our siblings we compare with our teammates we compare with what Tom Brady's eating. And that's very dangerous. And social media tends to really um, stimulate a lot of comparisons, right? People are posting, this is what I ate for lunch, or this was my workout. And so that comparison culture is very, very toxic and can drive towards a lot of disordered thoughts and behaviors and always feeling like I'm, I'm not good enough or I don't measure up or I'm not doing it as well as he's, he is. Um, and so just keeping in mind how personal the calorie needs are, again, even when you're in season versus out of season, or for an athlete to realize, okay, I'm injured, so I'm not training and doing my sport, but I still need nutrition to heal this broken bone or after my ACL surgery, right? Like there's a big misperception that if I'm not training and working out, that means I should really cut back on my eating because, you know, I don't want to gain body fat. But the truth is, is you need that nutrition to heal from that injury. And we need to um, address that. So again, just remembering that social media is a source of driving those comparisons. Because what we're concerned about is the situation called low energy availability. 
And it's been really well articulated in the athlete literature. So I'm using this as an example, but again, whether it's for academic performance or performance in the arts and music, anybody who's running in a low energy available state, it gets particularly amplified in athletes because not only might they have low food intake from restrictive eating and dieting, but they might have very high energy expenditure from the training or overtraining that they're doing. And so it causes this syndrome called REDS, which is in the bubble in the middle of the slide. And it stands for relative energy deficiency in sport. And some of you maybe know about a condition called the female athlete triad that's been around for many decades. And that's what the little red triangle is because the female athlete triad is inadequate food intake, again, low energy availability. And what happens is when the female loses her menstrual cycle, it's called amenorrhea because their body fat percentage is so low from the low energy intake over a period of time and how that negatively impacts your bone health and causes things like stress fractures or other types of stru com compression stress fractures in the spine or other types of broken bones, especially if you were to have a fall and it sets you up for early, you know, osteopenia and osteoporosis, which are really bad bone diseases. So the triad has been around for a long time, but in 2014, a lot more research had been done to show this syndrome of REDS and says, guess what? It's not just about females losing their period and the consequences to bone health every single organ system in the body is negatively impacted by the situation. Your heart, your GI tract, your immunity, your endocrine hormones, your metabolism, your hematologic indices, like the risk for anemia, for example, which also sabotages an athlete. Growth and development. So when this happens to adolescents, it's even more damaging than when it happens to, you know, a middle-aged adult, for example. The one I get particularly concerned about is the psychological bubble off to the lower left side. You might notice that that one bubble has a double headed arrow. And that's because not only does low energy availability cause psychological distress, but if you have psychological predisposition like anxiety disorder, depression, OCD, bipolar, uh, maybe even some trauma, like from bullying in your childhood or whatever it could be, your psychological um, concerns predispose you to low energy availability. And then the more malnourished you get, the worse your psychological well-being is. And so it makes the thoughts and the, the behaviors more rigid and, um, and disordered. And so that really fuels this vicious cycle. The other thing that the REDS model does is it says, guess what? This doesn't just happen to females. It happens to boys and men also. And so finally, we have an understanding of not only the prevalence of disordered eating and malnutrition in males, but the fact that all of these consequences physiologically can happen to them as well. Because you know, men's testosterone or boys' testosterone levels will take a plummet. And that obviously has consequences for them as well in addition to all these others others so while this is going on behind the scenes like nobody can really see a lot of these signs and symptoms what might be observable is how the athlete's performance starts to deteriorate whether it's their clarity and their focus before a race or their anxiety level before a game but you know their glycogen stores and their muscle fuel and their strength and their endurance and their you know, training response, like you, you're, you're not even getting as much out of your training when you're operating from this place. And so it really undermines what athletes and coaches and parents care a lot about, which is, um, you know, performance and sport. So it, it's getting a lot more attention. But the hard part is, is that so many of the things that contribute to low energy availability, like the over exercising, like the under fueling and dieting, or, you know, um, just an obsession with body image and this over evaluation that my body shape and size is the key to my performance or is the key to my acceptance in my peer group or, you know, social status or my, my likes on Instagram, this over valuation of the importance of body weight and body appearance. To some level, these things become very normalized in our society and particularly with the diet culture that tells us, you know, you know, 
use cleanses and, you know, um, use detoxes and, you, you know, all the different apps and, you know, fitness monitors that, you know, telling us to do more minutes and make sure that we're standing up. And, you know, again, for many people, those are, can be useful tools until they go to an extreme or until they're used by a person who has a predisposition where these types of behaviors and apps and social media influences can actually put them over the edge. Um, and so these are some of the concerns with regards to whether there's an eating disorder diagnosis, which are some of the ones in the colorful center of the slide, or if there's this disordered eating pattern where um, you know, it's a little bit more of a gray area, but my message to you is that we want to recognize these red flags sooner rather than later so that we can get connected to help and intervene. And I put the excessive exercise or the overtraining on there just to remind us that it's on both sides of the energy balance equation, right? How much nutrition is my child taking in and how much you know, energy are they expending through their sport? and their extra training on the treadmill or their extra runs that they're doing um, in addition to what they might be doing at practice. And particularly with athletes, it's a, it can be a fine line because so many of the things that athletes are praised for and that you know coaches love about an athlete who's very coachable, who's committed to their training. You know, Athletes love to use the words like dedication and commitment and they wanna prove that to their coaches. Um, and, you know, athletes will, you know, the saying no pain, no gain, right? They're going to keep training. And, you know, even when their body is telling them that they're exhausted, they see it as a sign of mental toughness. It turns out that a lot of those kind of personality traits are also very common in people who succumb to disordered eating and eating disorders. And so it's a very fine line between dedication and disorder. And how do we recognize when our students are getting a little bit too close to that line or have crossed over it. Um, I want to make sure that you know not to be fooled by the stereotypes because a lot of people think that eating disorders, you can see them because it's, you know, an emaciated appearance. And the most common ones that people often are aware of are anorexia and bulimia. And so the anorexia has a very thin, emaciated, significantly underweight look. And the bulimia, maybe you're aware of either binge eating behavior or purging behavior and vomiting, for example. But remember that excessive exercise is a type of purging. But eating disorders happen in all body shapes and sizes. They do not discriminate by sport. So this is not just about the swimmers and the ballerinas who wear, you know, uniforms or, you know, that show their body and, um, oftentimes makes them subject to more critique, but this happens, football players, lacrosse, volleyball, basketball, soccer, I've worked with it all, males, females, eating disorders do not discriminate at all. In fact, there's been more and more research and higher prevalence rates in a variety of subgroups of the population, boys and men, uh, people in larger bodies, LGBTQ community, people of color, um, in people who experience food insecurity, which again, that has been heightened by the COVID pandemic, for example. And so the demand for services and the rates of disordered eating and eating disorders have escalated um, quite a bit in the last couple of years. But some of the groups represented on this slide are very at-risk groups, but they don't always, um, because of the stereotypes, they don't always get recognized. And because of stigma, there are a lot of things that hold people back from seeking help and getting connected to helping professionals. And so that's why the education and the awareness building is so um, important to do. Because these conditions take a toll on, on our kids and on us as parents. Um, eating disorders affect every relationship in your life. So the parent-child relationship, the sibling relationship, romantic partner relationships, even coach athlete relationships. So, you know, these are some of the things you might be starting to notice, you know, your child withdrawing or not enjoying the things that they used to enjoy, or all of a sudden they're fighting with their friends a lot, or they're just having a lot of conflicts and tension because the disordered behaviors oftentimes are, they become coping mechanisms when the student is having such a hard time dealing with 
difficult emotions or conflicts or difficult relationships. And so again, it can become a part of this cycle because if someone's having difficulty coping with stress and they're under a lot of stress, um, then the eating disorder becomes the coping mechanism. It just continues to feed that cycle of concern. Um, lots of physical consequences, again, particularly thinking about our athletes, but these are happening even in non-athletes. I don't want you to think that this is only for people who play sports, but all of these you know, health conditions that lead to a lot more serious medical complications. I mean, eating disorders are life-threatening conditions. And this is super important because Lisa had you know, noted, and we were having this conversation offline about in each of the student sessions we did, a very consistent question kept coming up from the students. And basically it was, you know, if I have an eating disorder, do you have to tell my parents? You know, do my parents have to know? And that question really took me aback, again, as a mom, because I thought, substitute any other life-threatening situation into that sentence and see if it makes sense to you, right? So if I were in a car crash and I was in a coma, do you have to tell my parents? If I'm playing soccer and I have an ACL tear and have to be taken to the emergency, do you have to tell my parents? Yes, of course we do, right? And eating disorders are life-threatening conditions. People die from eating disorders. And the best thing we can do is recognize it and intervene sooner rather than later to prevent those medical complications and those devastating outcomes. And so it's really important for all of us to understand the seriousness of this and to help our students understand that we are here to help them um, and that we can get through it because there are helping professionals that can turn this ship around. Um, and so this is some of the sabotage part. And there's so many factors that go into this. There's no one salient factor. You know, some people might have a genetic predisposition. Some people might have anxiety disorder or depression that, you know, puts them at risk. Certain cultures, there might be increased risk or there might be protective factors. And then the personal characteristics of who we are as individuals and how we cope and how we deal with things. And what is our support network? And you know, how connected are we to friends, for example, and, and to our parents? And so there's so many things in the environment too, whether it's the home environment, school, you know, when they go off to a college campus, if they're playing D1 sports, you know, what their sport environment is even in high school, the relationships with coaches and teammates, very, very important. And then there's the stuff like the social media and the diet culture, the things that bombard us from the outside and the information that it gets really targeted at us as adolescents or as females or males, um, or again, transgender students. There's a whole, there's a whole lot in the gender um, diversity and LGBTQ community that's very important to understand as influences. And trauma, you know, uh, all different types of trauma um, transitions, moving off to college or transitions even in and out of a season or transition when your favorite coach leaves and now you have a new coach and you don't know what that relationship's going to be like, or if you're going to get any playing time, like all of these transitions are a lot for our students to have to cope with. Um, let alone if they experience a loss of a grandparent or, you know, just imagine all the different trauma points. And then of course the COVID-19, um, situation it's, really contributed to the perfect storm where like all of these or several of these factors can come together and really um, be challenging for, for families and for, for the adolescents. So the question becomes, when your student is struggling, who are they gonna turn to, right? Hopefully they're gonna turn to their parents first and foremost, but even by that question I just shared with you, I want you to be aware of how much fear, it's not just fear because there's also a whole level of the stigma of eating disorders and, you know, some people are ashamed of their behaviors, whether it's purging or binge eating, like a lot of people don't talk about that or feel comfortable sharing it. And so these things live in secrecy and in silence. And so how do we, you know, normalize the ability to talk about them and ask for help and say, you know, I'm, I've been experiencing this and I don't really know what it means, but 
you know, I need to talk with you about it. So parent, pediatricians, maybe the athletic trainer is a trusted person or the coach is someone your stu student might go to or school counselor, right? How, that's why we're doing all this education at the Hill School to get as many people comfortable and informed with having these conversations. Maybe they'll talk to a teammate or a friend or a friend's parent who, you know, they perceive as someone, anybody that they can trust because we just want them to walk through a door. And so um, I know Hill has been really great about pulling together an eating concerns team and you know, involving providers from different backgrounds, from nursing, athletic training, counseling, and when it's appropriate. Again, at least we've been doing education with, with the coaches, but they may or may not be useful members of the team because it's more eyes on the students to recognize risk sooner rather than later. Um, that's my comment about the question that my parents have to know. And so how do we address this? I mean, obviously we wanna have conversations. You know, first and foremost, they wanna know that we're concerned and that we care. Again, we know this from research that we've had, you know, people, there's a lot of, um, when people do get up the courage to share their experiences, Sometimes it's met with disbelief and people sort of dismiss their symptoms or say things based on stereotypes like, well, like you're not that skinny or like you don't throw up, do you? Well, just because you're not throwing up doesn't mean you don't have an eating disorder. And just because you're not in an emaciated body doesn't mean you don't have an eating disorder. And so, you know, really making sure that we're doing more listening than talking. We never want to be diagnosing and we definitely don't want to be judgmental. We absolutely don't want to be dismissive. We really want to validate what is being shared with us and try to tap into the emotions and recognizing that our students, you know, and, and you know, that our kids are really um, fearful about what all this means and they, they have more questions than they have answers. And so how do we then educate ourselves and connect to the helping professionals. Oh, is it okay if I talk just for a second about the school process? Because uh, we've changed it since when I first came. Okay. Um, we've had a huge increase of eating concerns, whether it's disordered eating or actual eating disorders. So when we have students come into the counseling center and they are um, through our assessment process screening uh, we have a five question questionnaire called the SCOF, and it's really just a quick kind of indicator of maybe a concern being there. So if they do score on that, then we will, uh, through the counseling process, uh, use a screening tool. And it's just a screening tool. It's not a diagnosing tool. Um, it's called the EAT26. And really what that tool allows us to see is if, you know, if there is a need for further assessment. So you know, we are all licensed clinicians here. We, we can work with low li level eating, uh, disordered eating, but we're not specialists and we're definitely not qualified to be doing uh, the heavy lifting with eating disorders uh, per se. So when a student scores above cutoff on that screening tool, we will notify parents. And so part of our informed consent when students come into counseling is we tell them this upfront before we even do any of the assessment process. So they're well informed um, and, and that's really important to know. So by the time they've said yes to all these things, um, they know that part of our job is to inform parents. So we firmly believe what Dr. Guatrimoni has said, which is this can be a life-threatening um, situation and we don't wanna overreact or underreact, but what we do want is another touch point. Maybe that's a dietitian, maybe it's the a physician, maybe that's an assessment through an eating disorder specialist or even a team like Renfrew is a great organization. Uh, but essentially the, the counselor is going to Zoom with the parents and let the, the student know that we will be contacting parents. And then from there, uh, there might be some treatment that's needed. Maybe it's an outpatient level, maybe there is more needed, but especially in the boarding setting, uh, we have to be very, very diligent about and careful about treating uh, disordered eating because it can definitely, um, you know, be detrimental to other students uh, that are living with each other, um, you know, and so we do, right, I mean, there are recommendations for all levels of care, uh, but we certainly want you as parents to know that you will be informed. Thank you. Oh. Excellent. 
Excellent, so important. And so where can you start to get education? The Academy for Eating Disorders has put out a series of really great handouts. The first one is called The Nine Truths About Eating Disorders. And it really busts a lot of the myths and breaks down the stigmas and says, you know, it's not just about genetics and parents are not to blame. In fact, parents are central to the recovery and the treatment of adolescent eating disorders and how the environment plays a role. And, you know, again, the life-threatening nature of these and the importance of early detection. There's another set called the nine more truths about eating disorders and boys and men. So again, don't think that, you know, your sons are less at risk of this than your daughters because they're not. And then there's another one called nine more truths about weight and weight stigma, which helps us understand the presentation of eating disorders of people in larger bodies because they are often the ones who are dismissed or said, you know, have those comments made at them like, well, you don't look like you have an eating disorder when they really are in a very disordered place and are just as sick as someone who's emaciated in terms of, you know, if somebody's dropped a significant amount of weight and their weight suppressed, you can easily be malnourished even in a larger body when you've lost a significant amount of weight and have been restricting your food intake, even if there's binging behavior going on. So we don't wanna miss or dismiss any of this because that invalidates our children and we don't wanna do that. So it's all about validation. It's all about who do you build onto your treatment team because treating these are very multidisciplinary. You need a, a pediatrician or primary care doctor to be really managing and keeping an eye on the medical situation registered dietitians help with the food piece and nutritional adequacy, mental health professionals help with dealing with the cog cognitive distortions and the thoughts that get in the way and helping to build healthy coping skills. Psychiatrists can prescribe medications or if those are needed for again, managing anxiety or depression or whatnot, maybe an exercise science or fitness professional helps understanding when it's appropriate to reintegrate exercise or if someone needs a restriction on their physical activity. If you were talking about an athlete, it's great to have providers who have an understanding of sport. And again, for treating adolescent eating disorders, it is family-based treatment as the model, which puts the parents in a real role of authority. And all of these other professionals are supporting and empowering the parents to play a central role in the treatment. And that's another reason why I tell, you know, our high school age students, yes, your parents need to know because they are a big part of the solution and a big part of your treatment and recovery if you get to that point. So how do you find a registered dietitian? If you, you know, certainly your pediatrician may have someone that they refer to that's in their practice, but the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has a search engine on its landing page called find an expert and you can search by your zip code and you can search by expertise. So if you're looking for someone with sports nutrition or eating disorders or GI you know, nutrition, whatever is um, you know, a specialty area you're looking for. Um, there are some great books out there that I recommend. I recommended these to the students as well for sports nutrition advice. The middle book is about avoiding that REDS, that low energy availability. Um, situation. And then if you have anybody who's transitioning off to college, the College Student's Guide to Eating Well on Campus is a great resource for them. These are all written by registered dietitians. So there's some of my top picks. Um, the National Eating Disorders Association is a great place to learn more and understand the diagnoses and understand treatment. You can search for treatment providers, um, but there's also a parent section. That's what I highlighted here. It's a forum for parents of kids with eating disorders. And again, all sorts of blog posts and people interacting and dialoguing. There's another great group called FEAST, um, the acronym. And it is a, basically a support and education community for parents of people with eating disorders. There's a chat function. There's all sorts of blog posts. And again, connection to services. It's really a go-to destination for parents really trying to empower your, your caregiving. And I also put up here a variety of blogs from eating disorder treatment providers. Um, Lisa just mentioned Renfrew. Um, we have Walden here in the Northeast, McCallum places in the Midwest. But again, these are some of the ones that I follow their blogs and, and balance. I think they're in New York. They might have multiple locations. I see them putting out great content and educational content, awareness building and 
just fantastic information for you um, as a parent. And so I'm gonna stop there to take your questions, but there's lots more resources here. So all of this is coming your way with lot, you know, where can I go for more education, more some handouts, some things that might be, um, you know, really useful. So I think I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and wanna hear from you in terms of questions or things that I might be able to help with. And if you're a panelist, I might have to unmute you, so you might have to raise your hand, um, and I, I'll be able to see, but if you're an attendee, um, you should be able to just unmute yourself. And this is a great time to ask um, any kind of questions about, you know, how do, what about this, what about that, um, you know, we're really, we're, if you're thinking it, another parent is thinking it, um, I can't stress enough how much we've seen an increase in disordered eating since the pandemic. I mean, I think it's always been here, but now that we're screening for it better, uh, my goal next year is to get in some screening practices, um, you know, with athletic teams at the beginning of the seasons and, and really um, kind of, you know, doing some preemptive screening so that we can be more preventative about this stuff rather than, it, you know, catching it on the back end. So any questions for um, Paula, you know, how do I talk about this piece or that piece or any questions would be welcome. I guess I would also echo the importance of getting support for yourself as an individual, in addition to getting support for how do I best help my child do this? Because, you know, a lot of the things that we can learn about, you know, attuning to our own language or words we use to describe food, you know, to get away from the good food, bad food dichotomy or the way, um, you know, how do we do a, you know, a very focused job at validating and tuning into the emotions of our child or how do we talk about our own bodies or how do we think about our own exercise or how, how, how do we get fitness as a family? Are we going on hikes and doing, you know, snowboarding and things we enjoy as a family or are we running marathons or competing with each other? Um, you know, all of the things that you could examine as to how best to support your child within the family system is a really important thing to get support around. So Paula, a question came directly to me. Um, how do I talk to my um, daughter if she's unwilling to discuss uh, the concerns that I'm seeing? What's the best way without being too pushy or going overboard? Yeah, and that can be really dicey. So I think all you can do is try. And I would say try more than once, like don't give up after one attempt because oftentimes, and we know this from research, when people tell us what was the turning point that allowed you to accept help or to you know, seek help, it was hearing the care and concern of an important other, whether it was a mother or a coach or a romantic partner. So express your concern and express it consistently, especially when you observe something like staying very focused on, you know, I noticed that, you know, you haven't gone out with your friends lately. You know, you guys used to love to go to the movies or you used to love to go to the mall and go to the food court, like has something changed? So be curious. I think it's really great to invite conversation and starting with, I noticed this or I've, I've observed that, you know, you seem really depleted. Like when you get home from practice, you just seem so worn out, like what's going on? So be curious, invite conversation, Try to listen to the emotions rather than like the logistics of like, oh, how can I problem solve? Like look for the emotions. Like, you know, yeah, I just feel like so tired. Like I'm running out of gas. I'm having a hard time focusing it. Like whatever you can pick up on and try to get to what's different, what's changed, what's, what's challenging you. Um, you know, expect denial and expect dismissal. Like, oh, it's no big deal. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Right. We hear that all the time. But the next time you notice it, bring it up again. I think another thing we can do as parents, if our kids don't want to talk to us, it doesn't mean they don't want to talk to anybody. And so, again, maybe on the third or fourth attempt, you might say, you know, I'm just getting more and more concerned because I continue to see you, you know, not being with your friends or you seem really unhappy or you seem, you know, just really exhausted lately or you know, I've, I've just noticed that, you know, your appearance, you're looking really a little pale or a little bit drawn. And, 
you know, I notice your sleeping habits are off. I'm getting really concerned. Would you be open to talking to someone professionally? So that someone might be your pediatrician, that someone might be a therapist. Maybe they're seeing a therapist for another reason and you're trying to encourage them to open this dialogue or maybe a dietitian. So whoever the door you can get them to walk through, even if they don't want to fully disclose to you, I can't tell you how many kids, I work in the college setting, how many kids I knew about their eating disorder long before their parents did. But part of my work with them is helping them tell their parents and let their parents be part of the solution. It's a little bit different in college because they're over 18 and they're adults. So we're not doing family-based treatment with adults, but Nonetheless, they need a support system around them and parents and siblings can be some of the best supports if there's open communication and understanding and that you know education piece to really know how the family dynamic needs to adjust to really be a safety net. So whoever you can connect them to, but definitely don't give up. Don't think, oh, she'll outgrow it or, oh, it's just while he's in season, he'll be fine when the season's over. Like trust your gut. I think a parent's intuition is definitely spot on. I have one question and also um, a comment in the chat. Um, I can't speak enough to how excellent Renfrew is. I was not I was not prepared about how an eating disorder affects the entire family, seeks to support and be strong. And I'll second that we use Renfrew for many reasons. Number one, their assessments are free. So they have no agenda other than to do a proper assessment. Um, and I like that. So they're going to, uh, you can get in relatively quickly after they do their assessment. Uh, they sit down with you as a family and they really talk through what they think the best uh, approach for treatment should look like. And some of that we can support here at Hill and some we can't, but we're certainly help. We want to help families get the right support that they need. So I really appreciate that. Renfrew also has a lot of great resources on their website and I will be, um, loading you all up with resources from both Dr. Patrimony and Renfrew after this is done. Um, the question we had is, um, could this be a phase? Um, essentially, can eating disorders be a phase, especially during high school? And what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, um, I don't think they're a phase. And I know that like people don't outgrow them and most people don't get out of them without some professional help. So they can be very short lived. They can be, you know, starting as disordered eating and you can turn the tide on that and avoid the development of a full blown eating disorder. Um, but no, it's more than a phase. I mean, if it truly is getting into a, the disordered category and meeting diagnostic criteria, it's interfering with social well being, academic, like nobody functions well in a malnourished state. You're not gonna be your best student. You're not gonna be your best athlete. You're not gonna be your best citizen in the community or even in the family community. So no, this is more than a phase. Eating disorders are not a choice. They are mental illnesses, mental health conditions. And so it's not something that people just sort of move in and out of and it's gonna take care of itself. Um, you know, and definitely eating disorders are not like that, but even disordered eating, I would want to get on that and offer resources and education or like, you know, even if it's under the guise of like, you know, for your sport or getting ready to transition off the calls, like, hey, it would be really great to have a meeting with a dietitian and learn about your personal responsibility for nutrition as you're making this big transition. Like that's very preventive and protective. And so again, that might open up a dialogue to explore other things to be addressed to fine tune and really put these adaptive eating competence skills into the life of your child that could prevent them from going further down the path. Because the truth is, is they're usually very well-intentioned and they start off again, I want to be the best athlete. I want to earn that scholarship. I want to earn that starting spot. I'm training to do a, my first marathon. Very great intentions, but they can very quickly become, a, go to a disordered place or an eating disorder. So they, I, I would not put it at all in the category of a phase. Don't worry about it. Give it six months. In six months, it could be very entrenched and enough. They could be a lot sicker. It's like the pace at which bone mineral density is lost within a year of restrictive eating behavior in the beginnings of anorexia, within a year, there's significant compromise to the, you know, you stop forming new bone. 
And that's not good for an adolescent who's trying to build their peak bone mass up to the age of 30. Like you either reach your peak or you don't, and then you're gonna have lots of consequences from that. So I would say not to ignore the red flags that you see and to trust your gut and to act on them in whatever ways, you know, most appropriate, taking it one step at a time. I mean, it doesn't mean that your first intervention is we need to go to Renfrew in, for eating disorder treatment. It's, you know, let's get an assessment. Let's talk with a professional. Let them, you know, give you some clue of how big those red flags are um, and what level of acuity you're dealing with. I, I just want to address to um, there's a lot of research from Dr. Luthar out of Columbia that addresses high achieving school data. Um, and she's studied high achieving students who attend high achieving schools. And what we've learned is that students who attend high achieving schools are five to seven times more likely to suffer from anxiety and or depression. And so, you know, there's a lot of pressure. This is this is a pressure cooker system, maybe different than a lot of other uh, school environments. And so I just think that eating disorder behavior, um, some of that is about control and some of that is about some other factors, but um, certainly I think that plays a piece. And this idea of achieving and, you know, um, this competitive nature for grades, even if we don't encourage that, it's here, um, you know, so there's things we can't change about the school environment, but I think that in the background, is this competitive nature uh, with students. And so, um, you know, educating them about fueling their body and recognizing the red flags, the sooner we recognize the red flags, the easier and more effective the treatment will be. Now, in building those coping mechanisms, like how the very first day of my eating disorder class this semester, I said to my students, as we're introducing ourselves, I want you to share a self-care tip. Like, what do you do to take care of yourself? And it was, you know, meditation or yoga or taking walks or spending time with my dog. Like, you know, we have to build up these adaptive self-care tools because those are our coping mechanisms for the stressors that are in our lives. And it's when we don't have those or we don't have good communication or a good network of friends or somebody that we can really trust. Like sometimes that's a simple question a therapist will ask, you know, is there someone in your life who you really can confide in? Like honestly, truthfully, what you're feeling and experiencing. And you'd be surprised how many people say no to that question, right? So we have to build up all these adaptive features and you know, eating competence is one of them and body neutrality and like body positivity is another one. And you know, the list goes on and on. So cultivating that my students were talking about journaling, which helps them process their emotions, because if you're processing your emotions, then you don't have to purge them, right, in the, in the physical sense. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. Um, I will make sure I have a list of everybody who's attending, so I'll make sure we get resources by email out to everybody who's attended. Um, I'm so thankful you're here. It's, um, we, I hope to have 300 or 500 parents here, um, you know, when we continue to do this work. So thank you. Um, please, please reach out if you have any questions, comments, you need support, you're not sure. Um, counseling at the hill.org or the elbrofling at the hill.org. Um, we're here to support you. And thank you, uh, Paula, so much. Your work has been so helpful to us and our students. My pleasure. Feel free to reach out if I can help in any other ways and I'll send these resources along and um, let's keep our keep our kids healthy. Just keep raising these warriors that have a lot to tackle in their lives, right? So we want to give them as much uh, armor to take with them forward. So thank you so much. You're welcome.